Hello, everyone, and welcome to Kid Spirits 2023 Global Summit. We're really happy you're here. My name is Elizabeth Dabney Hockman, Kid Spirits founder and executive director. This event is a very rare opportunity for all of us for a number of reasons, and we look forward to it all year. First, it's the one day where all of our youth editors and contributors around the world can have an in-depth conversation with each other and get to know each other in an informal setting. Today, we're joining uh, from eight different time zones, and we're having a second session this afternoon to include those whose geographical location precludes them from joining us now. But the origin of this special format goes back in Kid Spirit history almost 10 years to an in-person event we had called Table Talk. A few of you might remember it. At this intergenerational event, we felt that it would be really true to Kid Spirit's mission to have several thought leaders in their respective fields have a panel conversation with Kid Spirit youth editors. And the result was fascinating for all involved. And that's what we're doing for this first hour today. In a few minutes, a conversation between adult experts and our teens will commence with each of them, along with our moderator at the same table, so to speak. This is a unique and important conversation on the topic of well-being, which has special resonance for us all today, and how creativity can impact our well-being. And we're very excited to have Kid Spirit editors and contributors hailing from around the United States, Pakistan, India, Ukraine, Jordan, Liberia, Paraguay, and Taiwan. We're also delighted to have special guests who are here to watch and learn from our panelists, regardless of their age, and to hear from our community of participants through their questions for the panel. Welcome to Kid Spirit board members here in Brooklyn, California, Ohio, Washington, DC, Edboard liaisons joining us from India, Paraguay, Jordan, and Liberia, as well as Kid Spirit alumni, parents of Kid Spirit current editors, and special guests from South Africa. Before we get started, let's take a moment just to greet each other. It's nice to see everybody in our space. So if you haven't done so yet, please let's go back to gallery view for a moment. Turn on your camera if you haven't, because it's really nice to see everyone's face and look around. And we'll take a moment just to wave because it's really nice to see everyone who's here. Hi everyone and welcome. It's really great to see you, thank you. And we're really happy to all be gathered here. In just a few moments, we'll begin with a discussion featuring our guest panelists and two of our own Kid Spirit editors. At the end of the panel, all of our young participants will have a chance to ask questions. So when that time comes, please raise your hand on Zoom using the raise hand option. And our moderator, Louis Dabney, will call on you. And after the panel, Kid Spirit participants will all break into smaller groups to have the special opportunity to go deeper into our topic through conversation and creative activities. And now I'm very happy to be able to introduce Jawad Maya from our Jordan editorial board, who is going to get us started with introductions. Jawad, you can take it away. Thank you. Um, I'll be introducing Louis Dabney. Louis Dabney is a leader in the field of conflict resolution with 25 years experience specializing in civil rights mediation, restorative justice, ethnic and religious conflict, program management, system design, and training. He is a leading expert in the mediation of disputes pertaining to the Americans with Disabilities Act and has lectured on various aspects of conflict resolution practice at universities in North and South America South and Southeast Asia and Europe. Lewis is executive director of the Key Bridge Foundation, a nonprofit alternative dispute resolution practice that provides a range of conflict resolution, program management, training, and technical assistance services to clients in government, business, education, and nonprofits and unions. He was trained in he has trained and mentored hundreds of mediators across the United States and served in several leadership positions in the Association of Conflict Resolution. He has won, he was winner of the Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution 2020 Distinguished Alumnus Award. Welcome, Lewis. 
<laughs> Jawad, it's uh, such an honor to be introduced by you and um, and and to connect with you again in another Kid Spirit Global Summit. And I look forward to hearing from you again later in the program when we go through uh, Kid Spirit Awards. Um, it's it's such an honor to to be with everyone today. And uh, as Elizabeth was saying, we'll do like a, a bit of a fishbowl where we have a conversation between some uh, Kid Spirit editors and contributors and uh, Wendy McNaughton. And it's so incredible to have an opportunity to have an exchange with her as we have over the years with inspiring adult contributors. Obviously, Kid Spirit is, is about this incredible international youth network, um, collaborative network of, of um, creative artists. And we're here today to have an exchange around well-being and creativity and how deeply is that needed. And one of the inspirational things about working in Kid Spirit and with youth in general is we remember our own youths, those of us who are older and how you know as young people um when it, when we were in this demographic and the kids who are in it now have you know just reflect so truly and authentically and deeply about the challenges and big questions in life and there's so much that we're all contending with in this world with gun violence in the united states and conflict zones around the world where a lot of our um, contributors are, are are in harm's way, and um, the environmental challenges and all the things that we're contending with as as people of every age, and to have a chance to um, to collaborate together is just such a joy. So it's great to be together, and um, I'm here with uh, Wendy McNaughton and Isa Fridi and Conrad Tittle. And uh, we're going to have a little um, uh, round discussion. So I'm going to pass it to Conrad to introduce Wendy. All right. So I'm super excited to introduce Wendy. So Wendy McNaughton's work is based in the practices of drawing, social work, and storytelling. She, combi she combines the practice of deep looking, listening, and drawing to create stories of often overlooked people, places, and things. Wendy has worked on various projects across media and and fields and in collaboration with numerous groups and individuals. But one thing stays consistent. Wendy uses drawing as a vehicle for connection. As a visual columnist for the New York Times and California Sunday Magazine, Wendy drew stories everywhere from high school cafeterias to Guantanamo Bay. She, had, she has authored and drawn two books, How to Say Goodbye and Meanwhile in San Francisco, and illustrated many others, including the number one New York Times bestselling bestseller, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat, by Samin Nuzrat and New York Times bestseller, The Gutsy Girl by Caroline Paul. She's the creator and drawer in chief of Draw Together, a participatory drawing show for kids and Grown Ups Table, lessons and community for drawing minded adults. She's also the co-founder of Women Who Draw with Julia Rothman, an advocacy database launched in 2016 to increase visibility and opportunities for underrepresented artists, illustrators, and cartoonists. She lives in Oakland, but you can often find her on the road, speaking at conferences, universities, or companies, or in her mobile studio built inside the back of a Honda Element, doing the things she likes best, drawing. Thanks, Conrad. That was such a, like, yes. nice, thank you. I'm <laughs> I'm honored, and thanks for introducing me. And hello, everybody. Yes. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Hey, Wendy, can you introduce Conrad? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know what? I actually I have don't have the full introductions, but I'm gonna say that um Conrad, can I actually just jump in and ask some questions? Cause I don't have my full introduction of Conrad. Is that okay if we kind of go a little bit? <laughs> well, and also I'm that. happy to introduce him as well. It's not a problem. If so, you don't uh, mind, and then I can go into the question. Yeah, sure. And I'm and okay. I'll introduce Isa as well. Okay, great. Thank you. You bet. Um so Isa Fridi is a 17-year-old student living in Karachi, Pakistan, starting her A-levels. Isa's interests are journalism, history, and psychology, and she finds that the best way to express herself and her viewpoints is through her writing. She has found writing to be a medium through which she enjoys expressing her thoughts and various topics. In her free time, she loves to unwind with her friends and watch a good movie. And um, I... I uh, 
I had an opportunity to read her piece called um, In the uh, Violence and Healing Issue of Kid Spirit, Spring 2023. Um, uh, and it was, it was called Death Row. And it was a very um, piercing piece on um, climate change and the effects of climate change and how that sprinkles out very intimately into just um, you know, actual people losing their lives because of intense heat events and flooding events, and how the uh, those sort of um, macro and unravelings can really um, draw people, bring people into sort of desperate circumstances. So an absolutely piercing piece, and she was totally incredible. And uh, Conrad, I haven't had a chance to read as much of his work, but um, actually um, the uh, piece on a traumatic ember um, was an incredible uh, piece of writing that Conrad did on uh, reviewing the movie, movie about Emmett Till and the murder of Emmett Till uh, in uh, the racist murder of Emmett Till. So again, just speaking to the incredible depth and uh, and quality of all the Kid Spirit contributors that we have here today. But Conrad um, is a 16 year old high school student who lives in Houston, Texas. He greatly values his Polish heritage and thus avidly speaks Polish among other languages like Mandarin and German. He is passionate about the sciences due to their allure of mystery and discovery and draws from this flame of passion, his inspiration to write. Conrad is always awaiting new opportunities to exercise his creativity and share it with others. Um, so those are the, 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 we're, the, the four of us are gonna have a discussion with Wendy. So yeah, it's just incredible. Like um, it, people who are less familiar with Kid Spirit, like Kid Spirit has been syndicated in various adult publications and it's amusing to see in the comments how oftentimes people don't even realize that the work that they're reading is from people who are, you know, in their teens usually um, around the world and how polished and deep and um, incisive their works are and how challenging uh, they are for all of us to kind of take our world seriously. So um, also Isa is in Karachi and this morning she's been having some internet issues so she may be bouncing in and out. So this is real life in real time on Zoom. Zoom. So um, yeah, uh, Wendy, if you, you you know, well, let's let's um, let, let, let's uh, kick it off. Um, would you like to um, um, ask some? Uh, well, actually, Wendy, why don't you just present on your work for starters? And um, yeah, and I, it sounds like you're muted at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Zoom. Good morning <laughs> and good afternoon and good evening to everybody. I think it's so fun. Um, to be all over the world and in one place together. Um, I'm, you know, it's always a challenge not to be able to sit around a table, but it's really amazing that Kid Spirit has literally kind of created this international table that we're all at right now. And it's such an honor to be with all of you and in conversation. Um, so thanks for that incredible intro, Conrad. Um, I don't have much more to say. You kind of said it all, but I can show you all some pictures. Um, and I think, um, I think if there's, I, I just generally prefer um, kind of a conversation as opposed to like a one-way, you know, a talk. So if anybody does have any questions or anything like that, you can pop them maybe in the chat. And if somebody wants to, to throw those over to me, um, then I can take them. That would be so great. Um, but I'll share a little bit with you right now. I'm going to share my screen. Um, let me see if I can do this. Ready? All right. Are you all seeing that? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'm just going to talk you through a few of the little projects they were mentioned, but I'm going to talk a little about how I work and how I kind of got to, to where I am right now and what I do. Um, I've always drawn. That's kind of been my jam. Um, I mean, I think a lot of us, in fact, I would pretty much say every single person in this, you know, around this table right now, started off drawing around the age of maybe like five or six, somebody probably came along and said that the house you're looking, you know, you're drawing doesn't exactly really look like a house. Um, and then a lot of us started to internalize the idea that we aren't drawers and we stop drawing. But I just wanted to start off by saying, everybody here is a drawer. Drawing is a medium that we can use to look closely at the world and connect with each other. Um, and that is my primary interest. It is not about doing a good drawing. It's about using drawing as a medium for connection. 
Um, but I was lucky to have some supportive family members um, who encouraged me to draw. And I kept going when the world said, do it this way. You know, they said, keep going your own way. Um, and I ended up going to art school. Uh, I promptly stopped drawing when I went to art school and made really weird videos and tried a bunch of different weird stuff. Um, when I got out, I went and I worked in advertising because I needed a job um, and that would pay the bills. <laughs> And I learned there how to tell stories. I learned a lot about writing um, and how to kind of tell a visual story really quickly and make a strong impact. But what I didn't love about it is the only thing that we were doing in advertising at the time was like selling, I don't know, Coke or something like that. You know what I mean? Like selling soft drinks and th things that I didn't really believe in very much. And it was hard to get really excited and put my full heart into something that ultimately I didn't think was really very good for the world. So I had the opportunity to work overseas and have this experience where um, I saw that there was ways to use these skills I had, both the drawing and also the storytelling to make a positive impact in the world. But the thing that I was missing was how to work with people in a way that um, kind of centered the ideas that other folks had. So in art and in advertising, when you go to school for that, a lot of times it's being taught that like you're the person who has the great ideas and your job is to be the smartest one in the room and come up with all the ideas and sell them to other people. But in my um, experience working with other folks, I was like, my ideas are not the best ideas. I want to learn to ask other people questions and ask their ideas to really come to the top and be able to use my skills to support those. And that's why I ended up going to school for social work, because that was this degree that taught me how to ask good questions, work with all different kinds of people, um, and how to always center equity and justice at the heart of every conversation and project and everything. Um, I ended up kind of combining all of those and that's what brought me to the work that I do now. So you see there's this picture of this person standing there with a notebook, upper left-hand side, you know, there's a bunch of writing around and stuff. So that's a self-portrait, that's me working out, standing on a street corner, drawing and talking to people. And that is my favorite thing to do in the world is to go out with a sketchbook go to a place that I'm curious about or a place that um, has people there that I'm curious about and hang out and draw. Because if I stand there on the corner long enough, and I would say that if any of us stand on the corner long enough, people will end up coming up to me and saying, hey, what are you doing? And a conversation starts. Um, I take the drawings that I do mostly from life and I combine them with the words of the people that I speak with to tell the story that centers the voice of the folks who the story is about. Um, so that methodology I used to do this book, Meanwhile in San Francisco, which highlights, um, and that's where I'm from, by the way. So I was always curious about like, you know how, where we, where we live, we think we know it really, really, really well. But in fact, there's so many little, I don't know, groups of people or like places or whatever that we don't truly know the history of that we're always maybe curious about. But because we live there, we might just go past it because we're used to seeing it or the folks. I decided that I was going to kind of research my own backyard, San Francisco, and go speak with folks who um, I'd always wondered about, like the people who play chess um, on Market Street, the main street in San Francisco. Um, I use this methodology of going out, drawing people, talking, and put this book together about kind of uncelebrated stories of communities in San Francisco. Um, that's also what this pink bags of Chinatown. If you skip past those couple drawings and go over to the right, um, I spoke with people all over town. Then also after that, I was like, I don't want to stop. Not just San Francisco. What if I went and drove all over the country and talked to people? Because what generally I'm going to, here's, um, I think probably a lot of you from what I know about what you do, you probably do this anyway. But something I was taught early on was to always ask, and then what, right? So when we do something, I was like, I did this thing in San Francisco, I love it. Now, what more could I do with that? So, and then what? Okay, go around the country. Um, this guy on the lower right here, uh, he's a boot maker. Um, I was driving past uh, I was driving on a rural street in Utah, um, in the U S and I saw a sign that said boot maker. And if any of you ever have this, maybe you have this feeling that's like this curiosity feeling like, Oh, I really want to know what that is. I really want to turn around and go back and talk to that person. 
always follow that voice. I stopped, I went back, I knocked on the guy's door and an incredible story unfolded. Um, so I've done stories all over that are little bits and pieces like this. Sometimes I go and I spend a lot of time with folks. Um, at the top, there's these two images. I worked with the New York Times um, to go and be more of a, a observational journalist, I would say. The other stories I was talking to you about, I'm very, um, I use a lot of my social work practice in it. I'm very interested in really connecting with people um, and telling their stories. But I also have these skills of being able to draw quickly in places that are really hard to access um, because a lot of times cameras aren't permitted there. For example, Guantanamo Bay, probably um, the most challenging place I've ever been. Um, it was not great. <laughs> um, and there was a story uh, that a reporter there wanted to do um, to document the courtroom. And in order to do that, since their cameras are not allowed, um, they brought in this illustrator, this drawer to do it. Um, so I was there for a week and drew um, everything that was going on in the court. Uh, it was really challenging in that the other stories I was telling you about, a lot of that, that is um, centered in like emotional connection and connecting with people. And in a place like Guantanamo, you can't actually connect with the people who are there. So it's very much like I said about kind of this traditional journalistic distance. I'm going to tell you the truth. Not for me. Um, maybe some folks uh, feel it's very important. I'm very grateful to have had the opportunity and the experience. It's important that everything is witnessed um, and that images are brought out into the world. But my focus is definitely on connecting with people and elevating um, the positive, let's say, and being imaginative about what's possible instead of focusing on um, things that I are very difficult to change um, because of a lack of connection. So it's an important project. Thanks, Wendy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just it's just so amazing. You know, one of the things that comes through your work for me is like how attending to drawing creates presence and connection between people. Um, and like how having the sketchbook down instead of like in front of your face or in front of your heart, like creates this opportunity to connect with folks. Um, and so we'll continue um, diving into your work, but wanted to um, also introduce uh, another um, adult uh, panelist who's in, uh, who's joined us today, which is um, uh, Sonia Lubomirsky is also here. And um, uh, I Isa is going to introduce her. So um, Sonia Lubomirsky is a distinguished professor of psychology at the University of California, Riverside. Originally from Russia, she received her AB, summa cum laude, from Harvard University and her PhD in social personality psychology from Stanford University. Um, Sonia's teaching and mentoring of students have been twice recognized with the Faculty of the Year Award and the Faculty Mentor of the Year Award. Sonia's research on the possibility of lastingly increasing happiness via gratitude, kindness, and connection interventions has been honored with an honorary doctorate from the University of Basel, the Christopher J. Peterson Gold Medal, the UC Riverside Distinguished Research Lecturer Award, and a Templeton Positive Psychology Prize, among many others. Her work has been written up in hundreds of magazines and newspapers, and she has appeared in multiple TV shows, radio shows, and feature documentaries around the world. Sonia is the author of several books, including the best-selling title, The How of Happiness, a scientific approach to getting the life you want. In her work, Sonia has focused on developing a science of human happiness. To this end, her research addresses three critical questions. What makes people happy? Is happiness a good thing? How can we make people happier still? Sonia lives happily in beautiful Santa Monica, California with her family. It's and a Sonia, pleasure to be here. Thank, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you here, Sonia. And uh, we've uh, everyone's introduced as um uh, um 
let's see. I was wondering uh, if, if um, uh, Isa, do you have any questions for any of our adult panelists? Um, I have a few questions for Sonia. Um, okay, so I wanted to ask, at what age did you realize that you first really wanted to enter and explore the field of psychology and why? Hmm. Um, and hi, Isa. Um, uh, really, thank you for the beautiful introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, great question to start with. Um, I, when I was uh, in middle school, high school, I grew up in the, I grew up in the Maryland, Washington, D.C. area um, um, after immigrating, actually, from the Soviet Union. Um, um, I was interested in um, chemistry, biology, sort of the quote, you know, hard sciences, and we didn't have psychology, you know, in my high school, um, you know, we just didn't have it. So um, I really didn't know anything about it. Um, um, and I think it was actually the summer uh, after I graduated um, high school that I read a book. It was actually about um, the psychology of women. Um, you know, sort of men and women, the psychology of gender. And that, again, that's something that I'd never been exposed to. You know, this is what's great about like, you know, after high school, when you, there's like all these subjects out there that you didn't even know uh, existed. Um, and so um, I, I was interested in that book. And then I took a class. I actually, you know, I've, I, don't, I don't think I've been asked this question maybe ever. So, so thank you for asking. Um, I took a class uh, uh, in psychology my first semester in college. And so that's where it started. Um, and then I actually, and then I really wanted to be a professor. And again, that's something I hadn't really known about until I went to college. Um, and there was actually a Shakespeare um, class that inspired me. There was a professor, her name was Ma Marjorie Garber. She's a, like a famous Shakespearean scholar. And I actually remember she was giving a lecture um, on King Lear the play King Lear um, and it was like the most incredible lecture and um, and I thought I, I remember looking at her and thinking like I want to be her I want to do that um, and so yeah I wanted to be her but I don't want to be you know a Shakespeare um, professor I want to be a, a psychology professor so, thank you um, okay. so I haven't really gotten an opportunity to go through like all of your work of course yeah. but I wanted to ask what would you say is the most interesting research um, that you've conducted or found in all your years of experience? Well, uh, yeah, yeah, that, it's, I, I, it's such a big question. Um, so I study happiness and, it, you know, happiness is something that almost everyone is interested in. It's one of those topics, like if you're sitting next to an, someone on an airplane and they ask me, you know, what I do, actually, I often don't really tell them that I study happiness, you know, I, if I don't want to like talk about it the whole, the whole ride there. Um, so uh, the most interesting, I, um, well, I guess, you know, you know, Wendy was talking about connection, um, and I'm I'm gonna kind of give it away. But I've been studying happiness for 30 years, and really, what I've discovered, what I've kind of landed on after all this research, is that the key to happiness is connection. And so I, I, I don't know if it's the most interesting thing, but it's the most important thing that I think that I I've discovered. So in my in my work, what we do is we, we do what we call happiness interventions. So it's kind of like, you know, you, you, everyone probably here knows what a clinical trial is. You know, we've all gone through COVID and we've been following like the trials to, to develop new vaccines. So when you develop a new vaccine, you have to do these, you know, experiments and you have to like test the vaccine against, you know, placebo or sort of control drugs or vaccines. Um, and then you, you ask questions like, what is the proper dosage of this vaccine? And what should some people not take it? Or should it not be combined with certain other, you know, vaccines or medications? And that's kind of what we do in our work. Instead of instead of testing a vaccine or a medication, we test like happiness strategies. Like, so for example, we ask people to do acts of kindness for others. And we we'll, we might randomly assign you like every day for the day, I mean, every Monday for the next month, do three acts of kindness that you don't normally do. And then in the control condition, we might ask you to do something sort of neutral, like, like try to organize your time and write about your days. So just kind of write a journal. Um, and so we find that people who do acts of kindness become happier and they even become healthier than, than people who don't. And so that's, that's kind of an, ex an example of the kind of things that we do. Anyway, so we, we have found, for example, that anything that people do that connects them with others makes them happier so that's an acts of kindness is one example or it could be just like be more social you know it, it turns out it's actually pretty easy just like do something social this week that makes people happier so i guess yeah that that's really interesting and important to me 
Yeah, if I could ask just a, a quick follow-up question, if you don't mind, but uh, I'm, I'm wondering, it might be a hard question, but what do you think about like our like intrinsic human nature makes us like happy when we want, when we connect with others and make other people feel happy? Exactly. I mean, I can, you know, maybe I can throw it back to you guys, but um, you know, there, there's theory in evolutionary psychology, right. That sort of talks about why is it like, why is it that human beings seem to be hardwired to connect with others. I mean, we, we really are. And, and, you know, you could argue that that's how we survive, you know, that's how we, that's how we survived by, by sort of creating tribes, by sticking together, you know, so in try in times of threat or danger, you know, we, it, those of us who were not very good at connecting would not have survived. Um, that's also how we find mates and that's how we reproduce. Um, Cause that's really important for evolutionary psychology. So, we connect with others. We, you know, we find someone that we might want to, right, uh, you know, get together with and have uh, offspring with, have 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 children with, um, and so yeah. So it's it's there's this. I, I think it's it's pretty like there's a pretty good consensus that human beings are, are are hardwired to connect. And so so for example, there's a lot of discussion now about like Zoom and and you know, social media and screens and like we're not really hardwired to connect over a screen. Now it turns out that screens are still better than nothing, right? So it's better that we're all getting together now um, than we're not, right? So even though there is, you know, our brains literally like are not as in sync right now as if we were like face to face, but there's still, there's still connection there. You know, there's still learning there. So it's still, it's still useful. So yeah, anyway, great, great question. Totally. And, um, you know, you know I, I think of that Harvard longevity study, your alma mater, that basically wound up indicating that the biggest indicator of, of longevity is is connection. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, it, uh, uh, Conrad or, or Isa, do you have any questions for Wendy? Yeah, of course, of course. Um, yeah, yeah. So, Wendy, I, I mean, ask this, but like, so obviously through your work and through what you've been saying, like there's this like overarching theme of um, of connection, obviously, like what we've been talking about. Uh, and I'm wondering why uh, why you think like artwork is such such an effective way of connecting with others more so than, you know, mediums like writing. Oh, that's a great question. But I just would say that I'm not going to say that it's more than writing. I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm a yes and person. I'm trying to be. <laughs> um, so I think that uh, the drawing and artwork, um, creative creativity um, and writing are all really great ways to connect both with ourselves inside and with each other through that path. Um, but I will speak to drawing and say that for me, um, drawing in particular is a really strong medium of connection. Um, I'm most interested in drawing from life. Um, and that means that when I draw something or somebody, I'm looking really closely at it, right? And to do that, you have to slow down. You have to look closely in ways that we don't normally look at things. Our brains are usually making these kind of um, shortcuts to just take in information and like put it aside to move on to the next thing and make connections. But when we really slow down and focus, we're able to see, literally see more than we would when we're just moving through our daily lives. Um, it also helps that, that act of paying attention when we notice more. Um, I believe that it helps us care about something more. When we spend time focusing on something, we develop a connection to it. That connection is care. Um, and um, our heart, to be like our heart grows a little bit and we, you know, um, and so by my interest, and I would say all of us could do this by slowing down, using drawing to look closely at people, we end up developing connections um, with those folks we look at. Um, all of those stories that I was telling you about before, I'm going to be totally honest with you. Drawing is just a an excuse in a way for me to make friends. Like that's what it is. I'm, I'm getting out using drawing as a vehicle to meet people. And at the end of the day, um, I think that when somebody looks at a drawing that I've done, it might not be the most accurate. It might not be the most, you know, precise, but what you see in a drawing of mine is you see the time, the energy and the care that I spent with the person in those lines that comes through. So a looker or a reader a viewer um, can feel that connection. And I think that drawing does that in a way that photographs and such 
just don't really. Well, and Kid Spirit is such a creative collective of artists. I, I, you know, for those in the extended audience that haven't had a chance to like peruse some of the incredible contributions that have come in from all over the world over the last 15 years, it's really amazing. So Wendy, you're in really good company yeah. and vice versa. I mean, this is an art artistic community. So like you, you, it's really a treat to, to see you all connect. And can I just say one more thing to that? Because we, because there are so many writers also. I think the one thing, one of the many things that the drawing does is by slowing down, spending that time paying attention, we cultivate empathy, right? And we find those points of connection. Same thing with writing, right? When we put ourselves in someone else's shoes, when we're seeing things from different perspectives, that kind of connection changes our hearts and the connections throughout the world. So. Well, and, and and that seems to be like already like this theme that's just popping out as we just, you know, get together for the first time, the, the five of us, it's like already connection is emerging as a theme in, in creativity and well-being that, 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 that connection is there. And I'm, I'm actually, um, Sonia, I happen to be in Santa Monica as well, though I live in, oh. in DC and I'm here for um, a uh, conference of um, sort of therapists and, um, and coaches on, on presence and connection and care. So, you know, it's, it feels very, very topical to me. Um, you know, one of the great things about Kid Spirit is that actually, this is very unusual. Usually to have three adults and, and two young people is not how it is. It's usually all young people and one or two adults. So, um, you know, Wendy and Sonia, like, please um, dig in with, uh, with Isa and Conrad. Um, you know, what questions do you have for them? Because like Kid Spirit's all about like actually centering the youth. So, and part of the joy actually of these get togethers is seeing um, incredible adults um, contributing to the world who like turn around and are, are listening. So, you know, what questions do you have for Conrad and Isaac? Sonia, do you want to start? Yeah. Yeah, I'll start. And by the way, I, I'm so sorry. I um, want, wanted to introduce Isa, but was she already introduced? I got uh, it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry, Isa. Um, but I, you know, I, was uh, excited to read about you um uh and you know um being from Pakistan and actually that one is my question my first question is really it's actually about that and it's a it's about you know um well the pursuit of happiness which is what I what I'm interested in um um so do you think you know to, you know with your with your kind of uh, cross cultural experience um do you think that the pursuit of happiness is universal like is it something that like do we and and do do people def across the world define happiness that's in similar ways or in, in different ways? So kind of like, do your friends and family members in Pakistan do you think they they kind of want to be happy? They pursue happiness. Do they talk about happiness in the in the same way as people around the world, or is there something unique um, sort of about their definition or sort of the meaning uh, of happiness? You know, relative to you know from what you've discovered you know, meeting um, pe you know, you, people your age or family members or other people, um, adults, you know, around the world? So um, I definitely do think that the pursuit of happiness is universal, um, mm -hmm. but I believe that everyone views happiness differently. Um, maybe people in the same like groups or like communities, um, they have similar definitions of happiness. So for example, like my friends and family in Pakistan, I would say like the common traits um, of like viewing happiness is um, felt either through like love and connection, which we talked about, or opportunity actually, because um, by that I mean most of the time, at least from what I've seen and experienced, Pakistani families are very like close knit. Um, so just by spending time with friends and family, like immediate happiness is achieved most of the time. Um, and as for opportunity, I mean that living in Pakistan kind of like automatically limits one's like social mobility, right? Um, in life and limits their like hopes or goals. So like having access to an important opportunity or an opportunity that can get, that can get you like further to your goal, um, that's a really important factor in contributing to one's happiness. Um, and that being said, of course, like that idea isn't just limited to Pakistan. I'm sure many people around the world um, share the same views or um, mindset. But yeah, overall, I do agree that the yeah. pursuit of happiness is universal. Thank you. Um, I have other questions too. Or do you want to do maybe Wendy and I take turns asking questions? 
Um, I, can I go? Can I go? Yeah. Should yeah, I please. Do okay, cool. Thanks. Um, I got a question for Conrad. Uh, um, I love learning about your interest in languages. Um, and as as a drawer who only speaks one language, very sad to say, um, drawing has been this way that I can connect with people, kind of despite you know, language differences. I'm really like curious for you what that experience of speaking multiple, first of all, how many languages do you speak? Um, and also uh, what is your, how do you think that changes your experience in the world moving around being able to speak different languages? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, um, yeah, so first of all, I speak, I guess I, I could say four languages, but my German, German is the weakest for me. Uh, so there's, obviously English and then uh, Mandarin Chinese and um, Polish. So I speak Polish at home uh, with my family, uh, well, my mom only. Um, and Chinese, uh, Mandarin Chinese is really random. Just started learning in kindergarten because my, my parents wanted me to. <laughs> and I guess I'm thankful for that. I mean, okay, yeah. I mean, it's it's been such a great opportunity. And, that, uh, and so jumping off of that, uh, how it's changed my experience and how it's going to change my experience. Well, I mean, there's the obvious, like, um, kind of the fact that it, you know, it looks good on resume. It provides opportunities, but I mean, more so and more, uh, in the context of our discussion today, um, it's also another, uh, kind of, it's another vehicle for connection, of course, for appreciating, uh, you know, other cultures and other people. Um, and so sort of, sort of in my case, uh, obviously Polish heritage, I go to Poland every year, um, but that's my heritage. Uh, more more strikingly though, uh, the fact that I've been learning Chinese since kindergarten, obviously when I started learning, um, I didn't appreciate it as much as I do now because <laughs> I was in kindergarten. I mean, yeah, uh, so uh, I didn't have such a such a great appreciation for, uh, for my tools, but uh, obviously as I sort of grew older, I started to, and I started to appreciate it more. I actually, summer before sixth grade, I went to China um, in order to, you know, connect with, uh, connect with people there, um, kind of look at this culture that's kind of been overlooked a lot by, uh, especially, in, you know, in America. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. So, and that's just been just a great opportunity. It's going to probably, I'm probably going to end up, you know, studying there in the future, maybe even working there. Uh, and so just having this, this tool has, has provided so many opportunities for me to connect with people, um, you know, and enjoy the fruits of that. And, you know, just, yeah, it's been, it's been great. So yeah, that's, that's been my experience. It, it, it's funny as, uh, as someone from the United States, it's like uh, fewer people in the U S are as multilingual as is the norm outside of the U S. So, it, you know, in our extended audience, I'm sure we have, you know, with Isa and, and Sonia, I'm sure we, you know, we have lots of multilingual people here and, and Wendy, it feels like it's a, another connection builder, right? Just like drawing is a portal for you that can sort of bridge difference and that sort of thing. It seems like languages as well. Um, uh, uh, Sonia, do you want to ask uh, anyone anything? Yeah, I, absolutely. And, and and by the way, it's, this is such a fascinating discussion. Um, uh, and Conrad, your, your inspiration, I think, to other young people. Um, 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 I was born in Russia. And so, you know, I, I speak Russian with my family and and um and my I have a 12 year old daughter who you know thank God for Duolingo right so now like it's it's pretty I mean it's not perfect right you don't really learn the language sort of so deeply but you know so she's been studying by just by herself Chinese and Polish also a little randomly um um and uh, I, I think it's just a wonderful not not only for connection but also also to develop cognitive abilities right because as we know like you know people who are uh, bilingual uh, multilingual also um it. They have they, they experience sort of a transference of other cognitive abilities, so they actually kind of get quote smarter, you know, by by learning other languages too. Um, so um, so Isa, um, really fascinated to read your biography um, and your um, your experience and interest in writing. Um, and I guess my question is, it's kind of like a billion dollar question, which is sort of where does motivation to do what you do come from? So for Conrad, it's you know to study languages and other things and for you, at least one of the things is, is, is writing is sort of what gets, you know, what gets you up in the morning? Like what gets you to write, you know, cause many of us, you know, have certainly moments, days, we, we just are not 
motivated. Like we just like, I don't know, it's where we feel quote lazy, you know, we just can't get ourselves to do it. And you know, I think we all have that experience, certainly, even though, you know, like even the sort of the most successful people in the world, like they, they have that. And I'm sure you do too. But so my question is really, where's your motivation to write come from? Like, and where did it start? How did it start? Is it just purely like the joy of it? By the way, a lot of writers find it actually kind of torturesome to write. So um, it's not, not necessarily joyful. Um, is it is it sort of a, is it because you, okay. so great, you did, did well on it? So it, it, where does it come from? Um, so I would say the biggest um, factor which motivates me is probably the feeling of like satisfaction I get after I complete, you know, a piece. Um, because for a long time, I kind of struggled to find like, you know, my hobby, my thing, um, and I'm still searching for it. But as of right now, I feel like writing and like, you know, journalism, research, all of that kind of like fulfills that um, like missing piece in me. Because like when I look around and I see my friends like either into sports or swimming or like music. So I kind of didn't really have anything for a long time until um, I guess it just started from a young age. But I didn't realize it till recently that like, OK, maybe I am a good writer. Maybe this can be my thing. Um, so, yeah, just like that, like satisfaction kind of. Yes, thank you guys. Thank you for all on track. Sorry, someone needs to mute. <laughs> so yeah, I definitely think that the um my motivation influences my persistent persistence. Um, and if I didn't have that motivation to drive me, I'm not sure if like my joy from writing would be enough, like you mm -hmm. said, um, to keep me going. But yeah, what what advice? Just a little follow up. Um, yeah, like what what advice would you give to other young people or or kids? Um who, you know, want to write and they just, whatever, they just haven't, or maybe they start and, but then they kind of like give up, you know, they quit, you know, do you have any advice? Um, I would say stick to like topics that you're really passionate about because, you know, I've tried like writing articles or essays or anything about something which I don't have any interest in. And then it just gets super like boring, tiresome. Um, so yeah, I would say if, just mainly stick to whatever you feel passionate about whatever you have a lot to say and everyone has their own like kind of structure in writing everyone you know writes a different way so you just kind of need to find your own way your own path and yeah I love that um can I pick up and then off of that yeah, yeah and then and then we're going to pivot to yeah. getting questions from the larger group of youth contributors as well in a few minutes but yeah absolutely Great. Yeah. I mean, I just think that's like such a um, important point is to follow those personal interests and that each of us have our own you totally unique intersection of interests. And if we go into that area of those intersection of interests, not only is it going to light like spark all of our good feels, um, it's also going to be different than the way anybody else in the world can approach it. Right. And that's and to my question for Conrad here is that you have such an interesting intersection um, of uh, both writing and science, yes? And also you're talking about your interest in um, languages and pursuing that. Uh, if you were to kind of see that as an intersection and then you could just do any story, publish it anywhere, do you know, like, do you have some kind of a, a, a dream intersection, a dream gig? uh at this point that you'd want to do you're muted i think oh <laughs> my bad my bad my. No worries. Zoom, am i right zoom right yeah. But, uh, <laughs> uh yeah yeah so what i would really want to write is uh sci-fi like uh because i've never kind of tried to do that and i think it would be really awesome to try you know, maybe even have it like uh, published on, you know, on Mars or something, you know, <laughs> in the future. <laughs> Obviously, I'm joking. But, uh, um, but yeah, well, yeah, I mean, it, the reason why I would want to, uh, to write sci-fi is because, like you said, there's this kind of, um, there are these two, you, you could say warring parts of me, which is writing and, and science. And in reality, um, they're not warring. They're, they really kind of, they're, you know, there uh this kind of dance between um humanities and you know the sciences is is a beautiful one 
if you pay more attention to it. And so, yeah, um, the, the sci-fi that I would write, uh, I, I would want it to be, you know, um, you know, somewhat realistic. So use that science, but at the same time, kind of, um, make it blossom with, uh, with language and, uh, you know, this vehicle connection and, you know, cause obviously when it comes to sci-fi, you want it to be kind of mystical, but also at the same time, may have it, have it be attainable within, uh, the realm of physics, which makes it that much more, you know, fascinating. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thanks. So of course, course. So cool. Thank you. So yeah, we're gonna start opening um, the uh, discussion to other uh, youth contributors in the audience. Um, but uh, so so please get your questions in, and then um, we'll we'll recognize folks to to bring them in. And as questions uh, start to come in, um, uh, yeah, a, 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 any sort of um, Sonia, any final uh, thoughts on happiness as we sort of pivot to to the discussion with the larger group? Um, I, I guess um, the, the yeah, I've been, I was talking about the the importance of connection to happiness, but um, the you know we all you know we 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 all kind of want to be happy. Or we might define happiness differently, but we pursue it somewhat differently. Um, and and what I've just discovered is that it, the kind of the theme is connection, but but sort of there's lots of other things that that one can do to uh, sort of pursue happiness. And then what, but I should mention that the people who are happier are more creative, and they're physically healthier, and they're better leaders. They have better relationships. So it, it's not just about pleasure. It's it's about actually people who are happy kind of are benefit their families and their communities. You know, because they're um, they're uh, they're more cooperative. They're they're more helpful. They're uh, they're more productive and more creative. So, so the other thing that the the other things that I've been studying is um, gratitude, and so um, expressing gratitude is something that makes people feel really connected and 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 really happy. It seems a little hokey. Um, uh, and then other people study like savoring and meditation, and um, um, but um, but really, you know, kind of social behavior. As as I, I just wanted to kind of reiterate, um, but we all find it a little bit differently. So for some people, connection means. Um, going to a party, you know, and like really meeting lots of people or going to some to to something like this uh, or to to a conference or a summit. For others, it might be just spending more one on one time with your favorite family member or with your best friend. So it doesn't have to be like super social, but just sort of anything that has to do with sort of other human beings, you know, interacting. So that's that's kind of, kind of my my final words for now. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. And Wendy, any final thoughts on 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 drawing as a pathway to well-being and creativity? Um, yeah, I think a lot of people when I talk about drawing as an opportunity for um connection, people say, Oh, I don't draw. And I spoke a little bit about this before, but just to reiterate, um, I'm not talking about drawing as doing like a good drawing that ends up being framed on a wall. Like I think that anybody can learn to do that if you want to learn to do that, great. What I'm talking about is using the tool of a pen or a pencil to slow down, to pay attention, to look closely and to connect with something. And that's something that anybody here can do. It's almost like, think of it as like a meditative practice. Um, and it's also, um, you know, back to this theme of connection, something that we can do in community with each other, right? Um, and that is a really joyful experience um, that can help boost that as well. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, um, we're we're uh, um, the, our our extended kid group is being shy, which is <laughs> unusual. So um, please, anyone want to jump in with a, a question for um, uh, uh, when we we've got wait we have a question. <laughs> um, can uh, can uh, uh, Leroy be um, uh, brought in? Uh, Leroy just put a chat a, a question in chat, or uh, you know, I'll just I'll just read it. Um, who has been your main influence or, or role model in your drawing career, Wendy? That's uh, coming from Leroy. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I have some heroes now that I look to um, who kind of led an interesting life that I think ended up showing up in their lines, if you will. 
Um, there's an artist named Ben Sean, um, who was both a great drawer and a social activist, uh, and spent a lot of time doing mm, books and posters and stuff like that. Um, there's some things that hang in museums, but I actually tend to really appreciate artists like Ben Sean, um, who instead of creating artwork that goes in a gallery or, and only, you know, like 80 people see it and you got to pay a lot of money for it. I'm, I'm interested more in the artists that make posters that go on walls, that go in books, that go in newspapers and magazines and reach out to more people and inspire a large number of people that's much more accessible and much more about community. Ben Sean is one of those people. That's so cool. And, um, yeah, uh, uh, Anaya Verma has a question. If if we can bring her on, and also um, youth folks, um, there, there there we have Anaya. Um, just uh, feel free to use the reactions button to raise your hand if you have a question. But um, yeah, Anaya, what's your question? Uh, hi everyone. Uh, my question is for Sonia. So, uh, Sonia, I like uh, the field in which you're working in psychology. I like, I always, when I got to know about it, then I found it a, like a very interesting topic. And I also consider studying it when I go abroad for uh, like higher studies. But my question for you is Was there any one experience that uh, changed or, in a way, influenced your entire perspective about um, like life in general on it or like any? Uh, like things that like uh, instance that happens like one in a million times that really uh, guided you to become a better person and help people out. Mm. And Anaya, where are you? Where are you today? Uh, I'm from India. Where? Where in India? Yeah. Where? Where? Uh, in uh, it's a state called Haryana, if you might know, Gurgaon okay. district. Great. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, again, great, great questions. They're so hard. These are really hard questions to answer. Uh, um, um, a, a couple, a couple of things that I remember, I guess, from, you know, my, I guess, my childhood that really influenced me in terms of studying psychology and just sort of thinking about life. And one is actually um, has to do with cultural differences. And um, so I immigrated to the United States. Uh, we first came to Boston um, in uh, when I was 10 years old. And and I just remember Americans being so different um, from Russians, just like walking on the street, and they they just look happier. I mean, they just look happier. They they smile more. Of course, there's a lot of it's a kind of normative behavior. It doesn't mean that they are happier just because they're smiling. And they they talk like they would say hello when you pass them on the street. I mean, not everyone does that, and not in every city, like not necessarily in New York, um, but. But they do, uh, you know, I experienced that. And I just remember thinking that is just so fascinating, um, you know, how different people are in different cultures. So it got me interested in happiness and culture. Um, and also when I started becoming, getting be, getting friends and I would go have like, um, I would go have, you know, dinner at friends' houses, you know, in fifth grade. And again, I noticed like just how different it was. And, and uh, uh, you know, Isa was mentioning, right, like a very close knit family, obviously different families are different. And, um, but I just remember my family, like the Russian families were just so like loud and kind of rambunctious and people, you know, are like singing and like having like spirited arguments. And then I would go to these sort of quote American, of course, not a very American families are different, but the ones that I saw they would just be very like quiet and they'd be like, will you please pass the salt? And they're very polite, you know? And so again, I, I, it made me very interested in studying that. And so that 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 is sort of what I remember. Um, and then the other big thing was that I remembered my mom went through a period where she was really unhappy. Uh, and I would, I would, now that I think about it, I think she was depressed um, and, and really wondering why, like why, why was she so unhappy? Like, what is the root of that? And I also, there was a time that I became interested in sort of clinical psychology, right? Sort of like, why do some people get depressed or anxious and sort of how can I help them? And so for a time I wanted to be a clinical psychologist. I never actually did it, but, but uh, you know, obviously a very important, um, you know, kind of profession and I'm probably there um, uh, young people in this room that are probably interested in that. So, um, and I hope you pursue it. Yeah. Thanks so much, Anaya, uh, for your question. And we have another question from uh, Luca Calavarini. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, th thanks for joining us, Luca. What's your question? 
Um, yes, so this is a question for M Wendy McNaughton. Um, as we also have Sonia Lombrowski in the um, Zoom meeting, I felt it was only appropriate to ask, um, how did becoming an illustrator impact your well-being? Because of course you've taken many routes where you would, would be able to connect with people in social work um, and in advertising. So why pick you know, being an illustrator and how did that impact you? A great question. Um, <laughs> excuse me. I think that um, illustration, and I'm actually going, I'll, I practiced illustration for some time. I think illustration is kind of like a form of art. It's like a, a kind of specific path where you're working with other people to um, bring, let's say, text to life through drawing. I think that my work has expanded. I'll use the term illustration or, you know, art or whatever, but I just want to be clear about this. Like, um, that I kind of move more into an art zone where we can be very expansive um, in part because uh, I, for my own well-being, I like coming up with my own ideas and I like going up and, and kind of having control over a fuller art piece and doing like a full book. Um, so while the upside of that is my well-being um, has been strengthened because I'm able to uh, do a lot of things that I want to do, have the opportunities um, to pursue stories that I'm interested in. I'm going to be very honest and say the flip side of that is that um, a lot of times I try and do everything myself <laughs> and that can be really exhausting. And I think we should be clear <laughs> that... Um, Anytime we're doing like a, a heart led pursuit um, and we're carving new pathways, like I was talking about before about how everybody here has this unique intersection, you know, that we all can pursue. There's nobody who's cleared that path for y'all. Okay. <laughs> we have to really push forward and put our voices out there. And it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of energy and it can be really exhausting. And I think early in my career, I wasn't very good at taking care of myself physically. Um, I dropped exercise. I wasn't having like healthy, you know, physical habits. Um, and over time I've learned to, um, to balance more. So while the connection and the heart, that was always part of that. I think part of all of our work is to take care of ourselves, um, in all areas of our lives so that we're able to do that for others through our work. Thanks for the good So question. key, Wendy, thanks so, so much for that reminder. I mean, the self-care thing just seems more and more fundamental in <laughs> dealing with everything we're dealing with together. Um, uh, thanks so much for that question. And um, also, uh, if uh, can we, can uh, Esther Bala has a question? They're waiting for you. Well, um, we have Solomon Barbu on the screen. Mm -hmm. Hi, what are your questions? <laughs> Do you guys have any questions? <laughs> okay. Well, um, We've got uh, we've got other questions in the chat. Feel free if you have a question for either Sonia or Wendy. Not feeling it? <laughs> it's okay. So um, yeah, uh, there's another question from Victor in the chat for for Wendy. What uh, what inspired you um, to to draw, and what do you first think about when you draw? What inspires me to draw? Um, it's a great question. Kind of like on a day-to-day -day basis, let's say like in the movement, you know, that's actually, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to yes and that question right there. I'm going to say a lot of times when I sit down, I do not have inspiration of what to draw. I do not know what to draw. I know. And I think all of us have that happens to us. We, whether we're writing or drawing or whatever we're doing, we just don't even know where to start. And what I've found works for me is just to start <laughs> like, don't overthink just start moving the hand. A lot of drawing and writing, we don't think about this, but it's actually a very physical practice, right? So when I'm drawing with this like kid's Crayola marker, let's say, um, and if I don't know what to do, I might just start making some spirals. I might just draw like 
this coffee cup that you can't see because it's blurred. You know, I my whatever's in front of me, I'll start to draw. And I find that when um when I start moving my my body and I start kind of getting into um, a more present space, that things will will bubble up. It feels like they kind of come to the surface in my brain, and then um, I'll start getting ideas. So my inspiration does not always come from my head. Sometimes it comes from my body. Um, and sometimes it comes from my own curiosity too. Last thing I'll say, I think also a lot of people think with art and with writing that the artists and writers have all of these like genius ideas in their head and that we contain it all, that you all, we all contain this. Nah, uh -uh, no, it comes from other people. It comes from seeing something in the world, having something inside or another thing and putting two kind of unusual things together in a way that only you can because of those different interests that you have. Um, it comes from seeing and noticing and making notes and then putting those things together and incorporating your own point of view into it. That is where the inspiration really comes from. It might seem like it comes from kind of some other magical world, but it really comes from just paying attention and that synthesis. Yeah, and and Esther wrote in her question um, for Sonia, which is, um, what has been your major challenge in connecting with people through your study of psychology and happiness while making an impact? Mm -hmm. And thanks for if thanks for that, Esther. And sorry for putting you on the spot. If you wanted to re read it and uh, wanted me to read it instead of saying it. <laughs> Um, thank you, Esther. Um, and all of these questions are really great questions. I mean, I wish I could, I wish we could, yeah, have like another hour. We could just uh, follow I up. I know, it goes so fast. And what Wendy just said about sort of how our sort of ideas or or whatever you call it, intelligence, it's not contained in us, but it's sort of, it's it's actually like interconnected and spread a, across ever, the whole world, really. Like, uh, it, it, that's just it's such a beautiful way of saying it. It's true. Um, so um, yeah, challenge and connecting. Well, you know, actually really before, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, and, you know, when I started, there was such a thing as email, but that was really like what all we had kind of in terms of connecting beyond like our immediate work environment. So I've been a professor at um, University of California in Riverside, you know, which is near Los Angeles. And, but for a long time, like I was really just kind of, it was just kind of me and my colleagues. So I really wasn't that connected beyond that. Um, and so, and I, and I really wanted to be. Probably um, your guardians or parents. So, um, yeah. So that was really the challenge. Is like I really wanted to be able to have like more conversations and uh, collaborations. You know, in science, you know, we do we collaborate. You know, with people in in different places. And so then the, the more the more we were able to use sort of virtual formats. You know, like Zoom. Um, uh, the the more we're able to sort of connect and collaborate with others, sort of across countries uh you know the world really so that that really so i guess i've said so i guess the challenge is really much less now that to be able to connect with sort of any so i have i have collaborators sort of all over the united states and all over the world and i can it's so easy for me to sort of get on the phone or you know get on the computer um and talk to them about um you know really hard things you know we might be analyzing data we might be thinking about new experiments to run we might be writing together um, and so, um, so yeah, the challenge is a little bit less now, but it used to be quite challenging when, before we had the, the sort of these digital technologies. Yeah. And, and it definitely is like a two-way street. On the one hand, we couldn't possibly have a conversation like this. On the other hand, it's always really good to, you know, to be in person when we can. Uh, final question from, from Aisha, who I think isn't on camera, but might be able to be unmuted. Aisha, are you there? And you know, it, it, hi, it, it, hi, Sorry. Aisha. No worries. Where are you? Where, where are you? Problems with the mic. Yeah, no worries. Um, where where are you? Um, I'm from Lebanon, a Middle Eastern country. Have you with us? I want to, to ask uh, Mrs. Wendy a question. Um, how do you prevent yourself from getting distracted by everything around you and finding the right motivation? I don't know, Aisha. Can you give me some pointers? Because I get so distracted. Okay. Like <laughs> me too. <laughs> um, okay, so wait, the first party question was how do I get just get distracted? And then I got distracted by it and I didn't even hear the second part of your question. What was it? <laughs> 
<laughs> um, how do you find the right motivation? Do you mean to stay focused? Yes. Okay. Such a good question. Case in point, I can be like a crow or like a, you know, with a shiny object. Like it's, um, I think all of us are, are, um, our attention and concentration is really tested every moment of every day with these devices, you know, that we have that are, are designed to compete and distract, to uh, compete for our attention and distract us from things, to take our eyes and our presence away from something and give it to an advertiser or what a company or whatever it is. And it does it. And a lot of times with social media by feeding the connection that we're talking about here, right? It's what we're all looking for. So of course, we're going to be distracted by all the social media and stuff. So the first thing I want to say is I'm going to try and not beat myself up about it. If you guys don't try and beat yourself up about it. Okay. Because it's, let's just, let's just give ourselves a little grace. Let's start there. And then what I've noticed and what I'm trying to lean into more is that I pay attention to how I feel. If I go on social media for five minutes, which ends up being two hours, by the way, um, how do I feel after that? I don't really feel great. I eat, I, I feel like I ate a lot of candy. You know what I mean? I feel kind of gross. I feel full, but like, I still want a good meal. I don't feel good about myself. So I pay attention to that. And then, um, if I go and I draw, Or if, um, you know, if like Sonia was saying, like I go and I spend for me, it's like spending quality time with a couple people. I'm like a small groups person. Um, If I do that, how do I feel after that five minutes, which ends up being two hours with them too, right? I feel full, like in a really healthy way. I feel grounded. I feel stable. I feel solid and I feel connected. Um, So that's what I'm trying to do. I know I'm not going to fix it overnight. I'm not going to get off of social media. There's really great things about it. There really are, but I'm trying to pay attention to what really feeds me. And, um, like anything's a muscle, the more we do it, the more we're going to do it. Right. And so I'm trying to use drawing and quality time with people and practice that more. So great. Um, so, uh, I, I think that's all the time we have for questions for right now. Um, but we're going to, we've saved the, the, um, chat blog and we're going to, the, the youth among us are going to have, uh, an extensive additional time to work together on these subjects. Um, but I wanted to hand it back over to Jawad Maya, um, who kicked us off this morning to, um, share a really great video about the work that's been going on in Kid Spirit this year. Welcome back, Jawad. Hello, thank you. Um, thank you all for being here as part of Kid Spirit's global community. Since we are gathered together, we want to take this opportunity to showcase the winners of the 2023 Kid Spirit Awards. Please enjoy this short video highlighting some of the award winners and their celebrations around the world. has been a year of celebrations for the Kid Spirit community. From commemorating Kid Spirit's 15th year in publication to releasing a new anthology featuring hundreds of past contributors from across the globe, this year has been full of exciting milestones. Now we continue the celebration as we recognize the wonderful achievements of the 2023 Kid Spirit Award winners. Each year, Kid Spirit's network of youth editors around the world vote for the writing, poetry, and artwork they feel most represents our mission to explore big questions in an open spirit. From over 100 pieces published in the previous 12 months, they select those that are the most thoughtful and inspiring to win a Kid Spirit Award. To support meaningful festivities both near and far, Kid Spirit offered award winners the opportunity 
to apply for micrograms to fund their special celebration. Hi. An award winner from Ukraine transformed her celebratory dinner into a sushi-themed birthday party with family. Another winner in Jordan grilled hot dogs and enjoyed a sunny day by the pool with his friends. One winner, hailing from Paraguay, gathered with family, friends, and her liaison, a Kid Spirit alum, for cupcakes and festivities. In India, two award winners teamed up for their event and held a small reading to showcase their winning pieces together. An award winner from Texas had a book party and buffet to celebrate her achievements. Meanwhile, back in Paraguay, an award winner celebrated with her family and enjoyed a kid spirit cake and decorations. Finally, another winner from Ukraine had a picnic with friends by the water, enjoying some delicious food and swimming in the river. A big thank you to those of you who shared your parties with our community. We loved having a window into your creative celebrations. Congratulations to all 26 of the 2023 Kid Spirit Award winners and to every single one of our amazing contributors around the world. You are Kid Spirit. Joan, thanks so much for uh, sharing the incredible um, award winners from uh, this year's contributions from all over the world, the world uh, from Kid Spirit. Um, no what problem. a great discussion this morning. Uh, thanks to Wendy and Sonia and um, and uh, Jawad and uh, Isa and uh, Conrad for such a great exchange this morning. And, uh, you know, thanks so much for all the adult um, observers who were with us uh, today, the kid board liaisons who make the ed boards possible around the world and um, kid spirit board members and parents and alumni and, uh, and uh, friends and observers. Just thank you for taking time out this morning. The time sort of flew past. <laughs> with an hour. And so this is when we say goodbye to the adult, uh, the adult group. Um, but kids, um, uh, contributors, editors, um, we're just going to take a quick break. And then we'll be together for the rest of the morning in other breakout groups. So um, thanks for an incredible morning, everybody really making the effort in all the time zones all over the world to get together. And, and kids, please stay on because now like the fun part continues. Um, but Wendy and Sonia, thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, Conrad and Isa and Jawad, it was really a pleasure having a, a, this quick exchange with you all. And uh, uh, thanks so much. <laughs>